Hi, I'm sitting out here by the back door featuring Victoria's artwork and next to the food bank garden which is just beginning to, uh, to be worked on this year and I hope that uh, whatever you've just finished doing wherever you are and whatever it is you have to do next that you'll take some time now to sit still to listen to knit play solitaire but to listen to think to hear what it is that God might have to say to you and what he might want to hear from you dear Heavenly Father we thank you thank you for spring thank you for the birds that we can hear singing and for the trees that are beginning to bud we thank you that we are seeing hope coming down the road and we thank you that you have been bringing us through this difficult time please make your presence known now as we pray together and hear scripture together and learn together in Jesus name I pray amen
as I sit here recording this in this very empty, echoey room, there are still officially three weeks left in the stay-at-home order for the province of Ontario. Three Sundays when we are extremely unlikely to be seeing each other or meeting here. And as I think about that, there are some things about meeting together that I'm really looking forward to doing again as soon as possible. Over the next three Sundays, I want to spend our worship time together thinking about those things so that when we do come together again, we've had a chance to, to miss those things and to realize why we miss them. This Sunday, being the first Sunday of the month, would ordinarily be a communion Sunday. Now, we're not going to be sharing communion together online, but I have written something from my heart about communion and what it means to me, and I hope that you can relate to some of the things that I find when I think about sharing communion with you. I love communion Sundays. I love the first Sundays of the month in our building downtown, built of stones that were cemented together in centuries past, lit inside through colored windows that were created within living memory. When we share that bottled juice and that matzah. I love it when we are all sitting still and straight and facing the front of the room while the silver trays catch that light as they're passed up and down each row of us hand to hand becoming lighter and emptier as they go sort of like the opposite of the collection everyone takes one small clear plastic cup and holds on to it and waits and then the bread comes hand to hand. It's already broken into small pieces by reverent hands. And we take our bread and we hold it and we wait. The pastor reads from the scriptures. For I received from the Lord what I pass on to you. And then in his own words reminds us of what we are doing and why. We sit together in silence. We pray together to the accompaniment of traffic noises and trains and ceiling fans. And then we drink together and eat together. I love communion Sundays. Partly because in the ritual, in the familiar pattern, I find space to think and to be humbled. Sitting still in a quiet room, just being part of this family. Knowing that whatever our questions, the truth we share runs deeper. Whatever our differences, the love we share runs deeper. Whatever our struggles, we are here for and with each other. I love Communion Sundays, partly because in the stillness I find space to remember and to regain my focus, holding that piece of matzah between my fingers and seeing the stripes and the little holes, feeling the grit of it and the sharp edges and remembering Jesus. I love Communion Sundays. Partly because in the stillness I find space to remember and to be centered, staring down into the depths of that little cup of deep purple, seeing the light hit the darkness and make it glow just a little, just like Jesus entered the darkness of broken human life and brought 
his life that is the light of humanity, and that light was not overcome. I love communion Sundays. I love holding in my hand his blood and body, his bleeding and his brokenness, knowing that he bled and endured for us. I love being aware of the people in my life, being challenged to do what we can together because of what Jesus did for us. And what did he do? (laughs) He showed up. He lived our life, the good and the bad. He did what he could. He taught what we could learn. He gave us his strength and health for the times when we would have none of our own. And he was broken so that he could put everything back together, including me, including you. We can't hold our own brokenness in our hand. We can't look from above into the depths of our own bleeding. We can't always see the ways in which the topography of our skin and our soul is irrevocably changed by scars and by loss. We can't always see the ways in which our brokenness can help someone else. Only Jesus is Jesus. Only he could come and do what he did. Only through him can we do what we can do. I love communion Sundays. When I hold that little cup of purple and that little shard of white, and I think about how much it must have hurt. How much it does hurt. And how much, how very, very, very much it has all been worth it. And how very, very grateful I am to have been led for and to have the chance to bleed for and with you. For I received from the Lord what I pass on to you. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Savior, Jesus Christ, torn for you. Eat and remember the wounds that heal, the death that brings us life paid the price to make us one so we share in this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of table of the
In the same way, after supper, he also took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The blood that cleanses every stain of sin shed for you. Drink and remember he drained death's cup that all may enter in to re receive the life of God. So As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so with thankfulness and faith we rise to respond and to remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as his body here on earth as we share in his suffering we proclaim Christ will come again and we'll join in the feast of heaven Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice that opens the door, I will come in and have I'll dinner with them, the and they with me. Around the table of the king, around the table. Our scripture reading today is from John chapter 15 verses 1 to 8 and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit, if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away, like useless branches, and withers, such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Jesus told a lot of stories that used the stuff of everyday life to make points and to make them relatable to his disciples and the people he was telling the stories to. Today, if Jesus was around, he would probably use COVID-19 
as a way of telling a story, or you may make reference to the internet or to a, a, a sports celebrity or a movie star, something that the average person could connect with. When Jesus was on earth, he was living in a primarily agrarian society. Agriculture was the main industry. And so he used analogies, that, sorry, used analogies that would be relatable to the people of his time and of his place. And so in John 15, he tells the story using the analogy of a vineyard. And he describes God as the gardener and Jesus as the vine and us, those of us who want to follow Jesus, as the branches. And the goal of our lives, just like the goal of the branches, is to bear fruit, to bear fruit and to be connected to the vine of Jesus. In verse 8 of chapter 15, it, it mentions that the proof of discipleship is fruitfulness, <coughs> that the proof of discipleship is fruitfulness and that the goal of being a disciple, the goal of following Jesus is to bear fruit. Now, what does that mean, bear fruit? I mean, that's the analogy where in the vineyard, you want to see the grapes grow. And as, as I was looking at this passage, I was kind of like, okay, define that for me. Maybe, maybe it's a no-brainer. Maybe it's like, well, duh, bearing fruit is, is it's easy. But I, I kind of wanted to, a little more specifics. And so the fruit of discipleship throughout Scripture, there are three things that, that I came up with. One is to become more like Jesus. Corinthians talks about being made in his image, to be more and more conformed into the image of Christ. So bearing fruit is that we take on more and more of Christ's character in our lives. Secondly, we could look at the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, where it lists love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, self, fruitfulness, not faithfulness, sorry, faithfulness and self-control. These nine things, which I have a hard time memorizing. I can never get all nine. That's why I have to read them. Um, but when they become more and more part of our lives, we are bearing the fruit of the Spirit. And also fruitfulness means making disciples ourselves, where we help people find Jesus. We point people to Jesus and not just get them converted, but actually walk with them in discipleship and help them learn, help them grow, help them understand more and more about this new life in Christ that they have taken on. But the key, according to this passage from John 15, how do we bear fruit? We do it by staying connected to the vine, by staying connected to Jesus. And again, this may sound like a no-brainer, uh, may sound like, well, that's simple, but in reality, in our everyday life, it's not always that simple. It's not always that simple as we get busy with all kinds of other things and different things pull at our attention and, 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 and take our mind and our eyes off of, of Jesus and, and what he has, has called us to be and called us to do. Sometimes we, we, there are temptations to do things that are the opposite of what Jesus would have us to do sin. And so that can break the connection between us and Jesus. Staying connected to Jesus sounds simple, but it takes some, some effort and some energy just to maintain the connection. But it's the only way we're going to be fruitful as Christians. A branch can be away from the vine for a short time, can fall away from the vine and and because some of the, the, the sap and the juices are still in the branch, it can still bear leaves for a while, but eventually it withers away and dies. And sometimes we can kind of get disconnected from Jesus and look at our lives and go, well, I'm okay. <clears throat> I mean, nothing's changed all that much. But after a while, things do start to fall apart. And then you realize that you are disconnected from the vine, disconnected from Jesus. One commentator writes, as the vine imparts to the branches its sap and productiveness, so Christ infuses his followers with his divine strength and his life. 
it's the energy we get to follow Christ comes from the vine, from Christ. The branch does not bear fruit through its own effort. You don't see a branch sitting there going, come on, grapes, come on, just grow the grapes. I can do this. I can do this. The only way a branch in a vineyard grows grapes is by being connected to the vine and receiving what it needs in order to bear fruit. And there are three things that this passage talks about that are the keys to staying connected to the vine, staying connected to Jesus. Again, no-brainers in some respects, but things that we have to constantly keep a watch on in our lives to make sure that we are still staying connected in these areas. The first is God's Word. And it's amazing how we can neglect God's Word and just plain reading it. But it's also amazing how just plain reading it, how just giving over a portion of your day to reading God's Word and getting it into you daily or almost daily, like five out of seven days a week. Just even that little effort, it's amazing how much your outlook will change, how much you will feel and be more connected to Jesus. The second thing is obedience. So God's word and then obedience. James talks about people who are hearers of the word and not doers. <coughs> we can read God's word as a textbook and just as, a, as head knowledge, but we need to translate it into action, into things that we do that, um, that live out our fruitfulness, that live out the life of Christ in our lives. And the third important way of staying connected, of course, is prayer. A two-way communication. It's not just us talking to Jesus, but it's Jesus by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God speaking to our hearts and our minds and teaching us how to be fruitful and giving us the strength that we need to be fruitful. In the chapter previous in John 14, Jesus teaches that, the, that he will send the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will be with us and in us. That as we remain in him, he remains in us. We take up residence in Jesus, and Jesus, by his Spirit, takes up residence in us. The King James Version of this passage doesn't talk about remaining in the vine, but abiding. It uses an older term, abiding in the vine. You ever use that phrase, welcome to my humble abode? Abode comes from the noun for abide, the verb, and it means to take up residence. And so we are called to live lives that are so connected that we are at home with Jesus and Jesus is at home with us. And when we have that kind of connection, then we begin to live lives that are truly fruitful. Now, as important as the connection is, this passage also talks about something else that, that a gardener or someone who grows vines and grapes would understand. And that's the importance of pruning. And he says that the gardener will prune the branches to cut away the dead wood, but also cut away branches that, that are growing, but they're all growing in all kinds of different directions, and they're all scattershot, and they're all over the place. <coughs> Excuse me. So that pruning is important for the long-term health of the fruit. Because the dead wood would weigh it down and take a lot of this, sap the energy right out of it. And by pruning even branches that are alive, that are maybe not doing as well as some of the others, it, it concentrates the energy and the sap uh, of, and the strength of the vine into just certain branches, and it will increase the quality of the fruit by just eliminating some of the branches so that the, the fruitfulness can be concentrated in certain parts. And God prunes us as his disciples. And pruning involves cutting, and sometimes it can be a difficult and a painful process, not always pleasant, but for the long-term health of the fruit that we want to exhibit by following Christ, it's important. And so God prunes the dead wood. That's the sin in our lives, the sin that so easily entangles us and weighs us down and sucks the life out of us. And we need to constantly examine ourselves and be brutally honest with ourselves. Are we allowing our lives to, to, 
to creep into areas of sin, areas that are contrary to the life that God has created us for, uh, the areas that, that will work at odds with what God wants to, to build in us and the fruit he wants to build in us. So we need to always keep short accounts with God and ask forgiveness and then partner with Jesus so that that dead wood can be cut away. And then God also prunes us by pruning good branches. Now, those can be the things in our lives that aren't sin, and they're actually okay things, but they get in the way. They take priority over God. They take priority over our fruitfulness and becoming more like Christ. They're just things that get in the way. They're things that that have our attention and they drain our energy so that we have little left to give over to the things that really matter, the things that last for eternity. And again, so we have to examine ourselves. What are those things in our lives that we give hours and hours of time to, but at the end of the day, are they just wood, hay, and stubble? At the end of the day, do they really matter? Do they matter in eternity? And, and again, to partner with Jesus, to examine those things, and prune and cut them away for the good and long-term fruitfulness of our lives. So as Christians, we have been called to live fruitful lives, to grow in Christ-likeness, to have the fruit of the Spirit grow in us by the power of the Spirit, and to bring people to Jesus, to point people to Jesus, to, to mentor them, disciple them, walk with them along the way to a new life in Christ. And the only way to do that is not through our own effort, but through abiding in the vine. Sometimes we as Christians, we try to do too much of this Christian walk by our own effort. I was posting something on my Facebook page a few days ago, and it was talking about somebody who wanted to be there for somebody and walk with them in the, in the, the spiritual fight and to to really support them in, in a lot of ways that were really sacrificial. And, and somebody said, you know, I, I just, I don't know if I could possibly do that for somebody. And I thought, well, yeah, humanly, no, I don't think I could either. But the Holy Spirit working within us, and bearing fruit through us, we can do immeasurably more than we could ask or even think. And so by staying connected to Jesus, by abiding in the vine, by letting Jesus take up residency in us and us in him, being at home with each other, reading the scriptures, letting the scriptures, you know, kind of permeate our lives. That's the word I was looking for. Um, by living in obedience to what we, we read and learn from the scriptures. Um, by praying and, and being connected to Jesus. These are all ways that we abide in the vine. And then we need to submit ourselves to God's pruning, whether that's sin, which needs to be cut away, or whether it's things that aren't bad in and of themselves, but they have taken priority and they take up way too much of our time and energy. And we need to reorient things. Sometimes we need to allow God to prune. We can't do this in our own strength, like I said before. Verse 5 in our passage says, without him, we can do nothing. It doesn't say without him, well, we can still manage. Without him, yeah, we can still, we can still make do. We, you know, we, we get a C plus. Without him, we can do nothing. The original Greek gives the idea of slamming the door, shutting the door. There's, just, there's nothing. There's, there's no way around it. We cannot live the Christian life in our own strength. The only way we can do it to live what we're called to do, to live who, we're, who we were created to be, is to abide in the vine, to remain in Jesus, to stay connected with Jesus, to partner with his Holy Spirit, to bear fruit, and to live lives that we were created to live. And at the end of this passage, it says that we will live lives that glorify God, that honor him, and that will lift him up for the, so that all others may see that he is Lord. Father, I pray that um, you would help us to bear fruit. Help us, Lord, to examine our lives, to look at those places where we aren't bearing fruit, where 
your image and likeness is not seeping through who we are and impacting our character, where the fruit of the Spirit maybe isn't evident in our lives, where we're not pointing people to Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would help us not to do things in our own strength and just try and try and try, but help us just to, to stay connected to the vine. Help us, Lord, to stay connected to you through your word, through prayer, through obedience. Speak to us through your word, Lord God. Make it a, a, a reality, make it a real part of our, of our daily lives as we look into it. And I just pray, Lord, for, for each person listening and watching and for myself, Lord, that you would help us all to live lives that are more and more fruitful for you every day, to live lives that focus on the things that really matter, that we may give all glory and honor to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.